Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure here to speak today to you after in this very, um, um, very nice and exciting event we have here. My name is Tobias Kurt. I'm the CEO of Energy Brain Pool. We are energy market experts focusing on the questions of energy market design, how energy markets work, how prices are found in energy markets, and how they will develop in the future, how you can retail and sell electricity, and on the question how you can trade electricity. With this, we are actually giving trainings, doing scientific analysis and reports, and also consulting services for different stakeholders in energy markets like government, regulators, companies, corporations, and associations. We've been doing that for more than 13 years in Europe, and we are doing that now worldwide, because there are a lot of requests from all over the world, from Africa, South America, and especially from Asia and China, because beside Germany and the US, China is one of the most advanced and fast developing energy markets. And that's why I'm pleasure, uh, pleased to speak here today to you about that. We've heard a lot in the morning about the disruptive changes that are happening in the energy world in Europe and in the US, and how, how that will affect our world and the energy markets. And we also have heard that the large-scale utilities who have done this business in the last 100 years are kind of suffering with these changes. So I would like to speak to you about the chances in this ever-changing energy markets and how utilities or maybe other companies can adapt to that with new business models. We call these companies flexitilities. It's a mixture of the word of flexibility and utility, because we believe that this hits the point where the future business will be. And as Jeremy Rifkin said this morning, don't be wrong, this is not the future I'm talking about. This is happening right now. We do see that happening. So if we talk about energy markets, the world is on the way to be renewable. And renewable, I mean fluctuating production from sun and wind. And these generations will be decentralized and distributed, as we have heard. And of course, in a decentralized power generating world, there's no way around to adapt the other big development going on right now, which is digitalization and this world will be digital. So if you ask me, there are three main key factors we will see. The world will be decentralized, it will be renewable, and it will be digital, and as a fourth, it will be electrical. Because with the production of more and more electricity from fluctuating power as sun and wind, with zero marginal costs, it will lower energy prices constantly, and then will substitute other primary energy resources in different areas as mobility, as heating, with cheaper electric power. But as bright as this future is, there is also one contradicting development, which is urbanization. The United Nations predicted that in 2050, more than 50% of the worldwide population will live in urban areas, in big cities, especially in Africa and Asia. And this is kind of contradiction to the development to a renewable, decentralized world. Let me give you an example from where I'm from. I'm from the capital of Germany, from Berlin. We are consuming quite a bit of energy there, <clears throat> but we hardly have any renewables installed. We have a few PV systems, I think we have one windmill in whole Berlin, so there's not much renewable energy produced because it's not so easy in an urban area. While 
Berlin is sitting in a very rural surrounding where there's by now hardly anybody living, and there's a lot of space. We have developed huge amounts of wind farms and large-scale PV power plants around the capital of Germany, and this power needs to be distributed and delivered to the city. So there might be a certain business model left for the generation and distributing of energy from rural areas to cities. And with all these, what I've been talking about, it will be mandatory to adjust your business models, as we have heard. And it doesn't stop with the technology, but also with different approaches. As we have seen in Germany, where we have now 30% of the energy consumption produced by renewables, and 20% of that produced by solar and wind, we have been driving down the costs, the hourly price for energy, to a very low level. And this is not only affecting the utility business, but also the refinancing of these fluctuating renewables. So, as Chu Jiangzhong said this morning in his introduction, it's totally right. We are not only facing changing in production, changing in business models, but also changing in the financing and investment in power generation from what we have seen in the past. We, as a company, support investors and banks <coughs> in making the right decisions with our own energy fundamental market model, where we can model at the time being, the price developments in Europe on a wholesale level until 2050. But we can do that for any energy market worldwide as long as we have the data available. Because, as Kevin Kelly said, right, the business model of the future is collecting big data, cutting out your piece you need, analyze it, develop an algorithm based on it, and then sell the service. It's exactly what we do. We take the energy data from energy markets, we analyzed it, we developed an algorithm, and now we can predict power prices for power markets. And these are either short-term the base for your trading decisions, or in long-term the right way to judge your investments, your financing solutions, or to evaluate power plants and contracts. So, if we look at these new bus business models, how could they look like? And a research by the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland showed that... <coughs> I'm sorry. That actually, the most amount of money spent on innovation in companies goes into product and technology innovation and process innovation. But it is mandatory to have business model innovation because the 80% of your return from your company actually comes from business model innovation. Let me give you a few examples. Well, I'm not sure how popular Nespresso is in China, but you probably know it, or at least have seen the commercial of, uh, with George Clooney. So Nespresso neither invented the coffee, nor did they invent the coffee machine. What they did, they invented a new business model because they sell a rather nice-designed coffee machine. And the coffee is undoubtedly tasting very well. But I could have that with my old Italian coffee machine as well. What is new is that you just take this little capsule, you put it into the machine, you put it on and you get a nice coffee in any kind of taste you like. This is very convenient. But what make it, made it so successful was that they actually invented and combined business models. They used a rather old business model, which is called razor and blade, invented by Standard Oil in the beginning of the last century because they sold very cheap petroleum lamps and then earned money from selling the petroleum rather expensive. Why do I call it razor and blade? Well, Gillette adopted that business model later, selling you the razor rather cheap, but once you've sticked to that razor, you need to purchase expensive blades all the time. 
They took that business model and they combined it with direct selling because you only could purchase the capsules in their own shops or online in their online shop, and they combined it with in, um, that you only could sell the capsules at least for a time from them. So that was a very successful business model. Others very well-known examples are, of course, Apple. Neither did they invent the phone or the computer or anything. They just adapted it to the needs of their customers. And they found new ways of earning money, like selling apps in their app store, besides the money they earned from the phones and tablets. So as you can see, there is a huge potential in developing business models to earn money. And if we look at that, how can that happen? What do I have to watch out for? Then I agree with Alan Kay, who said, simple things should, should be simple, and complex things should be possible. And Dirk Becker, a very well-known scientific <coughs> Science, scientist on systemic organization in Germany once said, well, actually, people are paying you for taking complexity of them. And that's what I do in my company. I have an IT service. Could I do their work myself? Maybe. But it is very complex to have a whole IT surrounding running in your company. And I'm more too happy to pay them to keep this running because I need it for my work but I don't want to raise resources to keep that running. And I think that is exactly what's going to happen in the energy world. You can invest, if you want to, in your own production, on-site. Storage will be very cheap soon. But you still need to manage that. And I strongly believe that we as private persons, but also industry and commercial customers, they don't want to concentrate on that. They want to concentrate on their core business and get energy as cheap <coughs> and as sustainable and ecological as possible, but without needing to worry about that. Emery Lovins, who is, as Jeremy Rifkin, very well known with, for his visions, and I'm sure Jeremy would have agreed, said already in the year 1985 that customers don't want kilowatt hours delivered by their utilities, but they want energy services. And with the help of Jeremy Rifkin, as we have heard, because he consulted them, even one of the big four utilities in Germany, E.ON, understood that only 20 years later, <laughs> because last year their CEO announced that they will earn more money in the future with unsold kilowatt hours than with sold kilowatt hours. The big question who's driving utilities and companies in Germany right now as it is probably in China soon, is how can I do that? How can I add value to this mother of all commodities? Because electricity, it's very hard to difference yourself from competition. It just comes out of the plug. So how can you differ yourself in a competitive market? This is what we see is driving the utilities and other players in the energy market in Germany and Europe because with so much production from wind and solar and the prices being very, very low and also the competition being very strong. In Berlin, I can choose between 400 retail companies to deliver my power at home. So competition is really fierce. How I, and then there is a new movement that more and more customers are producing their own energy at home with solar panels, storage, storing it in batteries. So I'm losing, or utilities are losing business by the hour because they are not generating and distributing that kilowatt hours anymore. How can we find an answer to that question? And that brings me back to the beginning. Free your customer from complexity. Take away the complexity and he will be ready to pay you for that services. How may that actually look like? Well, Kevin Kelly pointed out that in this world, the flow of data 
and energy will be very closely related. And that's true. That's what I see. And that's what we, why we call it flexibility. Because you're not going to generate and distribute energy anymore as a core business. What you're going to do is handle all the energy and optimize all the production and consumption and all the technical devices, as well as acting and playing at, on as much markets as you can. In Germany, we have three markets for power, at least at the time being. It's a wholesale market where there is a price and a volume for every single hour of the day, so the price is ever-changing. And then there is a balancing power market to keep the whole system stable. The spot market with the hourly prices is very short-term. You have an auction today for the day of tomorrow. And, but you also have a future market where you can trade contracts for electricity delivery in the future. And already now, it's mandatory and very important to be able to work on all these three markets to earn enough money. And now imagine that more and more of our private and commercial customers are producing their own energy, storing their own energy. We will have more and more battery and other storage systems coming. We will have electric vehicles and electric heat heating. We've heard quite a lot about that in the morning, how self-driving electric cars will replace the combustion-driven private car we have. And we will have a lot of fluctuating generation and a little bit of controllable generation. You may have noticed that in our company, or I am here, I hardly speak about renewable generation and conventional generation anymore, because I think that's the wrong differentiation. The big, big difference is, is that you have, on the one hand, controllable generation. If it's biomass, nuclear, or natural gas, it's just slightly different. You can control these generation just the same way, following the demand. If you, the demand is high, you produce more energy, and if the demand is low, you produce less energy. But with fluctuating generation, as sun and wind, you can't do that. They are producing when the weather is right, and not when the demand is high. So that's a totally different approach, and needs a totally different market design and different business models. And I'm sure that even for these customers in commercial, private, or industrial sectors who are investing in their own production and storage devices, we call them prosumers because they are producing and consuming, another one of these artificial words, these prosumers will happily invest some money to reduce their energy costs, but will be more happy to spend money for the service of managing all these different options and optimize their energy supply. So they don't need to have to worry about that, but it will be available when they put the switch on. We've heard a lot about data mining and energy management in private households and additional values and services there. I'm not quite sure how much that will be. Very typical example discussed in Germany is that you monitor the energy consumption of your private household, and then you will see that the fridge is not as efficient as it used to be because it's too old and it needs more and more energy, and then you can sell as an additional service a new fridge. This may happen or not, but I do see a lot of business models in the industrial and commercial service because these players, they want to concentrate on their core business. They want to have electricity as cheap and as green as possible and available at all times. And here, and that's something I've seen discussing with a lot of re upcoming retailers in China, so it's a big question that drives you already is, how can I use that? And if you want to be good in competition, you may not focus on just selling the kilowatt hours because then you may only win by price. And I've been in sales myself for 15 years. I can tell you selling by the price is always very boring and not very satisfying. 
because you always need to be the cheapest, and then you earn less. But what can you do? Well, there are a few things, quite obviously. You could help them to save energy, energy efficiency, so they can be more profitable in their business. It's quite weird because you want to sell energy and now you help them to save them. That's exactly the difference, different approach I'm talking about. So energy savings would be one. I already talked about the difference in a market where you have a lot of renewables. And I can tell you in Germany now, with the uh, producing of sun and wind energy influencing the power price so much, and the price is being very low in the time of a lot of wind and a lot of sun, the prices are also very high in the times when the sun is not shining and the wind is not blowing. So it becomes totally important when you're actually consuming energy. So demand side management, adjusting your demand to the production rather than adjusting the production to the demand will be another service. And it goes very well together with energy efficiency, local production and storage, and then managing all that. Because sometimes, like on the weekend, the PV system or the wind park installed on the industrial area may produce <coughs> a lot of power because the weather is fine, but it's a weekend. Nobody's working, so the demand in the company is low. What are they going to do with this excess energy? They might store it in batteries or some other storage, but maybe it's still too much, so you need somebody to sell it. And that's what I think what the energy service will look like in the close future, but it's starting today. You and all these companies will manage the energy for, your, for the customers, optimizing all of this, trading excess energy, purchasing energy if your local production is not enough, and all overall delivering the best service. And here you can differentiate yourself from your competitors because you have better services. And if you have better services, you get paid better. So it's a far more convenient business surrounding to live in. So will the, for, will the big utilities be the drivers of that? Maybe, if they can adapt fast enough. In Germany, we see that they really strongly try to adapt now. E.ON, which I mentioned earlier, one of the big four, just announced last year that they will split off in two companies, one old one having all the old generation probably vanishing soon, and the new one focusing on transmission grids or distribution grids, renewables, retail, and services. The others kind of followed and announced the same, but I'm not sure if they will make it because they are big, they are slow, and they have really big problems adapting. There are other companies we've heard about today, like, of course, all the IT companies, the renewable companies. I had a very interesting discussion with Zhang Lei two years ago in our office in Berlin about the future of China and Germany with a renewable market and how it needs to be interconnected and how the Internet of Energy will solve parts of these problems. And I strongly believe <coughs> that there are a lot of companies out there being faster and more adapt to this kind of business. In Germany, for example, we have the telecommunication companies. And I mean, I'm already purchasing my internet, my telephone, and my mobile contract and my internet contract from the same company. Why shouldn't they deliver electricity? And we've seen that. If you walk into a post office in Germany and you're purchasing stamps, they will offer you an electricity deliver contract. If you walk into another coffee shop selling coffee, they will offer you a delivery contract for electricity. And the <laughs> okay, and um, also if um, I'm sorry, I was kind of disturbed. So they will offer you electricity contracts. And the question is not if the German telecommunication companies will come to this market, but when. And we've seen one of the big ones joining the energy market earlier this year, 
So it's already happening, and I think all the utilities need to be very fast and adapt very fast to join that. Step, going one step back in the last few minutes about how will be this transition of energy markets to a more renewable, more digital world happen, I believe that a global cooperation is key to success and the exchange of knowledge and experiences. I was very happy to speak earlier this week on the Global Energy Interconnection Conference here in Beijing about the importance of coupling markets, which is interconnecting energy markets over national, bo national borders, because it's very efficient, and about the importance of global cooperation. And because we do that as our main businesses, and we would like to support China as well as other players in the world with that, we last year launched our own news service, Chinese European Energy News, CEENews.info, in the internet, where we publish daily news from the European and the Chinese energy markets in three languages, German, English, and Chinese. And there you can, f with this, we want to encourage the information exchange in between Europe and China as the fastest developing energy markets of the world besides the US. So I believe this will help. And I'm quite happy that we are working more and more in China now with our training services, consulting, as well as uh, analysis with the government, with regulation bodies, but also with a lot of your companies, especially on the questions of retail, because the thrive, I, see here in this market and all the innovation and will to do business with this newly liberalized market is very impressive. And I'm quite sure that China's on a very good way to become not even the biggest generator, but also the most modern energy market in the world. I'm quite proud that I could give you a quick introduction on our point of view. I hope you enjoyed it. Please feel free to any questions. And just because I see that you all take a lot of pictures, give me the pleasure. I take a picture of you. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>